Hi guys, so can you see me? Yeah, hi, hi Deepak. Yeah, uh, I think my voice is clear, right? Yes, uh, good evening everyone. Thank you very much uh, for coming here uh, to be with me. So today, I thought, I don't know what topic to take today because uh, it was a, a little hectic week for me as well. So I wanted to take a little bit of concepts on CPR. Uh, so the latest guidelines on CPR. There was some uh, revision that happened in 2018. So it was the first guideline, I mean the latest guideline was released in 2015 the ACCHA guidelines and uh, after that uh, you know like they revised that in 2018 there was some revision that happened in 2018 not much changes only with regards to the prognostication there was some changes that happened in 2018 apart from that uh, there's no much difference to be honest so we are going to uh, see the bulk of the guideline first the basics and then uh, we'll be seeing is there any change uh, that might happen in the future as you all know like the guideline was supposed to come in 2020 but i don't think right now it will come because of the covid 19 pandemic i think they suspended the guideline release to 2021 or 22 maybe depending on how long the pandemic is going to take place anyway so what i'm going to tell uh, right now will be based on uh, the 2015 guideline okay yeah, so that's what we're going to discuss anyways that's fine let us uh, move on to the guideline per se so first we'll be starting with the a patient, I mean a PLS, the basic life support thing. So, will be with, whenever you start witnessing a patient who's having going to have a collapse. So, what are you going to do? So, what is the next step? So, you are witnessing a patient. So, you are maybe in a supermarket, witnessing a patient who was undergoing a collapse. So, what you are likely to do? Anyone? What is the next step, ma'am? Nobody's answering. Okay. That's fine. So I'll answer myself. Uh, no, actually, we don't uh, really check for pulse. In this setting, first of all, uh, we have to check for the. No, not even call for help. We have to check for responsiveness. Yes, yes, uh, allegopin is correct, yeah. Check for responsiveness. So, I don't know, uh, multiple times asked question, but still, I don't know why uh, many people were not able to answer this. So, that is check for responsiveness. That's the first step. So, this is a question. So, I mean, not, not only just a question. So, that's what uh, you have to do in the first place. You have to first check for the responsiveness. So, that's the most important aspect, really. Just one second, I'll check my uh, screen presence I think uh, that must be fine all right okay sorry for it so check for uh, responsiveness so that's what I'm uh, going to do first so once you check for responsiveness whether they are responding or not responding that's what your uh, uh, thing should be so you know that once the patient is responding to your uh, query so I mean uh, then whatever you ask whether you ask them uh, your their name or their address so whatever it is so they're responding then which means there is no cpr here. so there's no need of any cpr so you have to just wait for the emergency crew to arrive and you have to address the cause of the collapse for that you need a separate evaluation it could be just a syncope not a, a cardiac arrest so because we have a different definition for a cardiac arrest which you'll be seeing sometimes so you are not going to see cpr to a cpr so suppose if the patient is not responding for that matters so this is the time you have to be a little bit alert and uh, immediately you know like not responding means you have to call for help because this little bit of a bad scenario you have to call for help and uh, at the same time you have to check the pulse so the next trivial question is going to be on where will you check the pulse where will you check the pulse and how you are going to check the pulse Yep. Yeah, Niharika, you have to check on the carotid pulse. 
and how much time you should waste uh, for checking the current impulse you should not waste more than 10 seconds so within 10 seconds you have to check the current impulse you should not uh, quantify the current impulse your idea is to objectify the current impulse whether it is present or not present that's it there is no need to quantify the current impulse at all so whether the pulse is felt or the pulse is not felt that's all it's not like feebly felt i mean slightly felt nicely felt there's nothing like that it's felt or not felt that's it if it's felt once again uh, you don't give a cpr there's no CPR needed here. So here uh, in this setting, the patient might have a pure respiratory arrest, but there is no cardiac arrest here. So there's no CPR needed again. Suppose that the pulse is not felt. So this is what is the true definition of a cardiac arrest. So which means uh, what is the definition of cardiac arrest? If uh, anyone asks what do you mean by a cardiac arrest, you have to clearly tell a patient who is not having a pulse. So this is the patient who is likely to have a cardiac arrest. So that's what my answer will be. So that's what you have to answer as well patient who is not having a pulse so this is what we refer to as a cardiac arrest clear just one second okay so once the patient has got a cardiac arrest so this is the time where immediately you have to act upon and the next step is do a CPR. So which means that when the patient uh, is not going to have a cardiac arrest means you have to definitely do a CPR. So next step. So next question comes, what is the most important component of a CPR? So who's going to tell what is the most important component of a CPR? Rami is telling airway, Vikram is telling uh, chest compressions. What is the right answer? It is a chest compressions. That is the most important component of a, uh, you know, like CPR, according to our current guidelines, because the main role of this 2015 guidelines is the fact to emphasize on the chest compressions. So that's what they did actually. They emphasized a lot on chest compressions. So which means chest compressions are the basis of any CPR. So that's the most important component of a CPR. It's not the airway, it's not uh, breathing, it's always the circulation and that is the chest compressions which is going to be the most important. And uh, one of the most important element of chest compressions is the fact that you have to give a uninterrupted chest compression. That's really, really important. You have to give a uninterrupted chest compressions in the sense like you should not interrupt the chest compressions by any means. Please do understand the fact that uh, interruption of chest compression at any stage is associated with a very very poor prognosis very poor prognosis and poor outcome in terms of brain outcome in terms of your uh, life outcome in terms of survival and all these things are going to be adversely affected if you're going to interrupt the chest compression so if somebody asks you what is the most important component of a cpr right now the answer must be chest compressions that's it nothing else so interruption of chest compression associated with extremely poor prognosis Okay, so you have uh, started the CPR. So obviously you know the C A B is the current, uh, you know, like algorithm for doing a CPR. Can we give nitroglycerin if we have it? Why you want to give nitroglycerin? So what is the reason for giving a nitroglycerin when the patient is not having a pulse and then the patient is in a cardiac arrest? I don't think there is any role in giving nitroglycerin unless and until you have an acute coronary syndrome with a high BP or acute coronary syndrome with severe pain and a normal blood pressure. I don't think there is any role for nitroglycerin here anyways you have a circulation airway breathing and uh, to be honest you know like the circulation is the most important as i told you the chest compressions then followed by the airway i have i think uh, in the same unacademy i have taken a separate uh, special class on what about the airways the basic airways the advanced airways all these things i have taken a special class i think a little while ago maybe a month or one and a half months ago and then you are going to emphasize on the breathing fine so anyways how fast you will give chest compressions what is the chest compression you will give and what is the rescue breath you have to give rescue breath you have to give so both has to be matched if you are in a bls algorithm if you are in a bls that is basic life support 
you have something called a chest compression to rescue breath ratio that is called a CCRR that's called the chest compression to rescue breath ratio so that's what we refer to as CCRR so if you have a patient who is an adult uh, irrespective of the number of rescuers you are going to give chest compression to rescue breath at the rate of 30 is to 2 suppose if it's a pediatric you are in a pulse that is pediatric uh, advanced cardiac life support in a pulse the ratio will be a little bit different in pediatric life support like for example if it's a single rescuer if it's a single rescuer you can give it 30 is to 2 but if double rescuer if more than one rescuer is there then in this setting you can give 15 is to 2 so this is for the pediatric age suppose if the patient is a neonat if the child is a neonat in this setting you can give 3 is to 1 so in this setting you can give 3 is to 1 so these are the various guidelines for uh, chest compression to rescue breath ratio so there is a terminology called uh, push fast at the same time push hard so this is the terminology that is often used that's called a push fast push hard technique but i believe this is often uh, mistaken by many candidates often they push too fast and they often push too hard so why i wrote that fact is the uh, you know like reason this should be completely avoided so that's not the case you have to push fast and push hard but that, that doesn't mean like you have to push too hard and push too fast so which means how fast you have to compress and how hard you have to compress so that is also very important because this this is very important as far as your advanced cardiac life support is concerned which i will be discussing in some time but uh, keep that in mind that it is not too fast or too hard it's just push hard and push hard so let me tell you what is that anyways so you have uh, achieved a good chest compression and you are having an uninterrupted chest compression and uh, your AED arrives. What do you mean by AED? Can anyone tell what do you mean by an AED? What do you mean by AED? Yes, no, like this is a very simple question, isn't it? So this means it's an automated external defibrillator. Automated external defibrillator, right? So that's what we call it. It's a very common device that is uh, available or any defibrillator for that matters you can take. So the moment your uh, defibrillator arrives, so till this you are in the BLS algorithm. So till this you are in the basic life. So even if you are in the hospital, till this you are in the BLS only. So once the AED arrives, you are going to enter the ACLS management, that is advanced cardiac life support. So because uh, your defibrillator has arrived. So what you're going to do with the defibrillator right now is the fact that uh, you are going to see the rhythm of the patient. So you're going to see the rhythm of the patient, which is uh, fairly important. So in the AED itself, you have to see the rhythm. So there are many types of rhythm are there, but uh, for our simplicity, you have to know only there are two types of rhythm which is important. One, we can split into where the patient is having a shockable rhythm or if the patient is having a non-shockable rhythm. That's it. Nothing else. You're going to have a shockable rhythm or the patient is having a non-shockable rhythm. That's what. Nothing else. So this is what I'm going to split into. So what do you mean by a shockable rhythm? So there are ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. So this is what we refer to as a shockable rhythm. But remember the fact, VT has two types of uh, ventricular tachycardia. One is called a VT with a pulse and a VT without a pulse. This is called a pulseless VT. But please do understand the fact, VT with a pulse, you are not going to do CPR at all. Pulseless VT is the one uh, that you are going to consider as a part of a cardiac arrest because whenever a VT has a pulse uh, you should not put under the CPR guidelines itself in the first place because whenever there is a pulse obviously you are not going to take it as uh, cardiac arrest in the first place so exclude VT with pulse only pulseless VT will be put under this ACLS algorithm and obviously VF will always be pulseless so, like if you have a VF in the rhythm in the ECG and the patient is having a pulse then you have to strongly suspect that it is either someone else's ECG or uh, the ECG is wrong so VF can never have a pulse. VF is something like ventilator, I mean ventricle just fibrillating. So I don't think there will be any uh, uh, pulse in a patient with a ventricular fibrillation. So either there are two things. One is pulseless VT and second is ventricular fibrillation. So these are the things that's going to come under a shockable rhythm. So what do you mean by a non-shockable rhythm? 
non shockable rhythm you are going to have two uh, entities one is called a pulseless electrical activity what do you mean by pulseless electrical activity any electrical activity any electrical activity apart from the ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation so we define as a pulseless electrical activity even if the patient has a normal sinus rhythm and the patient doesn't have a pulse that is uh, called as a pulseless electrical activity so any condition apart from vtvf and they don't have a pulse is a pulseless electrical activity and second one is asystole asystole obviously many of you would be uh, you know like definitely uh, uh, aware of that so that's a flat line so this is what we refer to as an asystole so it's essentially a dead patient but still can be revived at times so that's what we refer to as a flat line is what we refer to as asystole fine so once you have a shockable rhythm obviously you're going to get a shockable rhythm in this setting what will be the next step what is the next step anyone and what is the next step as far as this uh, non shockable rhythm is concerned so shockable rhythm what are you going to do next Yes, of course. You know, like I'm waiting for someone, someone else to answer. Obviously, uh, for a shockable rhythm, you are going to shock him. That's all. So shock. So what is the shock you're going to give? What kind of shock? DC shock. But what kind of shock you're going to give? A defibrillation. Defibrillation. That's what I'm going to give. What do you mean by a defibrillation? Defibrillation is an unsynchronized shock. It's an unsynchronized shock. It's not a synchronized shock. Uh, that's what uh, you're going to do. So there are two types of shock. Uh, whenever you give a DC shock, please do understand DC shock should be given only for tachyarrhythmia. Tachyarrhythmia only. You should never give for a bradyarrhythmia at any cost. So you can have a synchronized DC cardioversion and unsynchronized DC cardioversion. This unsynchronized DC cardioversion is what we refer to as a defibrillation. So what do you mean by synchronize? Synchronize means you are going to synchronize uh, at a at some place. So usually, I mean, let me draw a VF itself. So this is a ventricular tachycardia. So suppose if this patient has a pulse. Suppose if this patient has a pulse. If this patient has a pulse. This is a VT with the pulse. Then you have to go only for a synchronized DC cardioversion. So you should never give an unsynchronized defibrillation. So which means where you are going to synchronize, your synchronization should happen. Usually the machine will synchronize at the peak of the R wave, which means the shock will be delivered at the peak of the R wave. And uh, you need not uh, time in such a fast rhythm. The machine will take care of it. Just press the sync button. That's it. Nothing else. The machine will take care of it and is going to synchronize uh, the shock at the peak of the R wave. Or you, I mean, sometimes the machine can synchronize at the beginning of downstroke or beginning of upstroke. That doesn't matter. But the idea is not to synchronize on the T wave. That's very very important because if you're going to synchronize on the T wave, this should not happen because that will result in a phenomenon called R on T phenomenon, and uh, the rhythm might degenerate into a even more bad rhythm like a polymorphic VT and a toss up. So you should never uh, synchronize uh, at the T wave. So this is what we refer to as a synchronized cardioversion, usually synchronized at the peak of the R wave. But remember, whenever there is a VT without a pulse, whenever a VT without a pulse, which means it's uh, very, very clear that VT without a pulse will be a cardiac arrest. This patient is having a cardiac arrest. So without a pulse means in this setting, in the setting of an arrest, you can do a defibrillation. That is unsynchronized cardioversion. So here there is no point in doing a synchronized cardioversion because uh, yeah, that's why I told you. you know Vikram is asking if there is a pulse, uh, we should shock. Yes, we you shock it. Suppose the patient is unstable, you do shock, right? So pulse, whether it is present or not, matters. Suppose if there is a tachyarrhythmia plus patient is unstable, patient is unstable plus you have ruled out a sinus tachycardia plus rule out a sinus tachycardia, plus patient has a pulse. In this setting, you will do a synchronous cardioversion. 
suppose same 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 suppose if the patient is having a pulseless vt or a vf then you can do a defibrillation or an unsynchronized cardio version so that doesn't matter so anyway so this is what you're going to do so you have shocked it and what is the kind of shock you deliver there are two types of shock are there one is called uh, monophasic current and uh, second one is called a biphasic current monophasic current and second one is called a biphasic current so remember monophasic current uh, will be using approximately 360 joule of electrical current and biphasic current uh, you have to prefer two, 200 joules of electrical current uh, in either monophasic or biphasic what you will be preferring usually is the fact that you have to prefer a biphasic whenever it is available suppose if you don't know what type of current it is whether monophasic or biphasic or whether what current number to give if you don't remember at that point in the scene then uh, you can turn the knob to the maximum once you turn the knob to the maximum you can just uh, shock them so that is fine so just uh, uh, shock to the maximum level that's all so if you don't know what is the amount of current you have to give so give the maximum current so this is what you're going to do anyways once you have shocked it obviously you are going to resume CPR for two minutes resume CPR for two minutes this is a very important point because usual mistake that generally tends to be done is so after this shock you will be checking the monitor check check monitor for cardioversion so which means whether the rhythm has cardioverted or not and uh, this has to be avoided and this is something has to be avoided because uh, I mean that's a natural tendency all right but uh, even I used to do the same thing again and again many times but uh, it has to be avoided and try to give uh, CPR for two minutes at least the reason why we give CPR for two minutes even after you have shocked and the patient has uh, reverted back to the sinus rhythm is the fact that uh, the patient will have some, there are too many reasons are there you are unnecessarily wasting time suppose if the patient has not reverted back to the sinus rhythm so you're unnecessarily wasting time and you are actually interrupting the cpr number one second if the patient has reverted to sinus rhythm in that setting what you're actually doing is the fact that um, you are eliminating one possibility called post cardioversion stunning so what do you mean by post cardioversion stunning even after a shock the ventricle will be in a state of stunning so that it will not the rhythm might come but will not be contracting properly. So that is why it is very, very important to resume CPR for at least two minutes. So then check the rhythm again. Then check the rhythm again. Clear. Similarly, in a pulseless electrical activity and asystole, so the next step is nothing. You have to just resume the CPR. That's all. You need not do anything else. So just resume CPR. So there is no shock here. Because these are non shockable rhythms, as I told you. Obviously, you, you don't give a shock here. So, you are just going to resume CPR for two minutes. And once again, you have to check the rhythm. So, once you have checked the rhythm, once again, the rhythm can be either a shockable rhythm at this point or a non shockable rhythm at this point. Non shockable rhythm at this point. So, depending on that, once again, the cycle will continue. So, I can draw the cycle here. Once again, the CPR cycle will continue depending on whether it's a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm. So clear? So, I mean, this is a very easy one to understand. So this is how we are going to do. But even though doing on this uh, scene is a little tough because uh, many of us understand, I mean, forget the basics of the CPR in the first place. So what do you have to do? So most importantly, whatever may be the fact doesn't matter. There are some quality on chest compression. So the CPR quality has to be noted. So what are the guidelines with regards to the CPR quality? So that's really important to understand. So as I told you, in ACLS, it's very, very important. To, I, I mean, at least in a BLS, when somebody uh, uh, who's not a doctor is doing a CPR, then that's understandable. When being a doctor, if you're doing a CPR, so you have to be a little bit careful and cautious and you have to be, uh, you know, like, following the guidelines very properly because these guidelines are based on evidence and uh, we should not deny that evidence in the first place. So push hard and push fast, push fast, clear? So what do you mean by push hard and push fast? At the same time, I've clearly told it's, you should not push 
too hard or too fast and that should be clearly avoided because in indian setting this is a very very common mistake that everyone does that is pushing too hard and too fast so what do you mean by push hard so you have to compress at least 2 inches that is 5 cm so minimum so this is the minimum compression that you have to do at the same time you have to allow the chest to recoil that's really really important allow the chest to recoil back completely recoil back completely because i have seen many interns who press so fast and they don't even allow the chest to come back to normal level so you have to allow the chest to recoil completely which is uh, very very important allowing the complete chest recoil and next second one is uh, push fast so what is the rate of chest compressions can anyone tell what could be the rate of the chest compressions that you have to give correct niharika yes uh, it's in the rate of 100 to 120 per minute so this is the rate of chest compressions you have to give definitely not more than that definitely not less than that just 100 to 120 so less than that will be insufficient and it will be avoided and anything more than that 120 also has to be avoided because for example i have seen interns who give at a rate of maybe like 200 300 per minute if they give very fast so then what is the difference between you and a ventricular tachycardia because both are doing the same thing so you should avoid uh, over compressions also which means whenever you increase the number of chest compressions you are actually reducing the diastolic time and you will be reducing the filling and you will not be allow allowing the heart to fill properly so that once again you are going to kill the patient faster so don't uh, do a very fast chest compression as well just do at a rate of 100 to 120 and that must be more than enough that's it so push to i mean uh, not push too hard and too fast and at the same time avoid interruptions as i told you because interruptions in chest compression is associated with extremely poor prognosis and you should never do that clear remember uh suppose if you don't have an advanced airway because there is something called an advanced airway and if there is no advanced airway advanced airway in the sense we talk about uh, laryngeal mask airway or a uh, endotracheal intubation this is what we refer to as an advanced airway suppose in this setting of uh, where you do not have an advanced airway uh, you will not be knowing about how much to give and how fast you have to give the rescue breath so you can give 30 is to 2 ratio itself no problem so if there is no advanced airway and we didn't talk about the rescue breaths had we i don't think so so rescue breaths what is a amount of rescue rescue breaths you have to give say anyone because many people have answered it is 100 to 120 per minute so uh, how much is the rescue breath that you have to give what is the number of rescue breaths Two after thirty. So I'm not talking about two after thirty. It's ten uh, per minute. So this this should be the number of rescue breaths you have to give. Ten per minute. So this is the guideline that tells you you should not give more than ten per minute. Suppose if you do not have an advanced airway, then you can follow thirty to two protocol. But if you have an advanced airway in situ, so it's only ten per minute and definitely not more than that. It is ten per minute. That's it. So which means that's what I tell my interns: one in six seconds. That's it. Nothing else. definitely not more than that 1 in 6 seconds that's all so 10 breaths per minute anything more will result in uh, hyperinflation of the lungs and hyperinflation of the lungs itself will compress on the heart in the mediastinum which will result in restricted filling and your uh, bp will fall more and uh, there won't be any return of spontaneous circulation so don't do that so just 10 per minute if at all you are going to have an advanced airway if you do not have an advanced airway then you can follow the 30 to 2 protocol not a problem similarly what is the gold standard for us i mean assessing the quality of the cpr is there any indicator to tell the quality of the cpr is there any gold standard is there any uh, methods to tell that there is uh, a good cpr quality going on what i'm asking is about is there any quantitative assessment to tell whether the cpr quality is good or not 
Wow. Thank you very much. So you have answered very nicely. So the answer is ETCO2. So n tidal carbon dioxide. n tidal carbon dioxide is a way to assess the quality of the CPR. If Alagapan can tell the criteria to tell uh, a good quality CPR, then I'll be even more happy. What is the criteria to tell uh, that the quality of CPR is really good? Wow, Niharika, good. Once again, so the ETC word is more than 10 centimeters of water. Sorry, 10 millimeters of mercury. ETC word is more than. I mean, it started again. Sorry for that. So I think uh, this one note and OBS doesn't go very well. So I will write very slowly. If it is 10 millimeters of mercury, then uh, probably, I mean, you might assume that your CPR quality is good. So I will try to start a new page, maybe. Let us see. So if it is ETCO2, still it is the same. So which means the new page is not the problem. It sucks. Usually. Okay. So more than 10 millimeter of mercury, then you can uh, talk about a good quality of CPR probably. Suppose if your ETCO2 during CPR is less than 10, so what you will do? If it is less than 10, what you will do? So you have to attempt to improve CPR quality. So you have to keep in mind, so if the ETCO2 during CPR is less than 10, then uh, it is better to try and improve the CPR quality. Fine. So that's what you have to do. Cool. So this is the one way to assess the CPR quality. And at the same time, uh, you can do an IABP, I mean uh, intraarterial pressure. Can anyone tell what is the recommended intraarterial pressure during relaxation phase? So intraarterial pressure can be monitored if you have a intraarterial line. I mean, suppose if you have a line. So if you don't have a line, then that is different. Suppose if you have an intraarterial line, uh, then you can measure the intraarterial line. Yeah, I'll come back to that. When to when to intubate. So intraarterial line, uh, if you if you can, you can uh, put an intraarterial line, and you are going to measure the compression during the compression. What is the arterial pressure reading in the monitor? And at the same time, when you release, that's a relaxation pressure. When you release, um, what is the value that is going on in the monitor? So intraarterial pressure can be checked, and uh, you can check the compression pressure and relaxation pressure. Remember. This is nothing but a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure. Remember, uh, you know very well, heart, when it is contracting, you have a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure. But uh, when the heart is not contracting and it's a cardiac arrest means, then obviously it will be a your CPR related compression pressure, which is equal to that of a systolic pressure and relaxation pressure in CPR will be equal to that of a diastolic pressure. So the ideal way to check the intraarterial pressure is during the relaxation pressure, which should be at least more than 20 millimeters of mercury. This is, the, this is the usual routine thing. Suppose if it is less than 20 millimeters of mercury, the relaxation pressure during the CPR, then uh, you have to improve the CPR quality. So that's what the guidelines tell. Because your CPR quality is not good. Many people are asking why ETCO2 is measured here. So I think uh, Asi is asking how to see ETCO2. Remember ETCO2 can be checked in multiple ways. ETCO2 can be checked in any advanced direction through any advanced airway, there is a probe called ETCO2 probe which can be fixed with the endotracheal tube or even in a laryngeal mask airway also you can fix a ETCO2 probe. So that's not a big deal, it's like a pulse oximeter only. So I mean obviously if you have attended any ICU postings, it's very easy to find out. So advanced airway, any emergency or ICU postings or casualty postings if you have attended, definitely you should have encountered this ETCO2 probe. It's a fairly straightforward small thing. and uh, any advanced airway should be attached with ETCO2 probe. Fine. So why ETCO2? Next question, Deepak is asking why you uh, see ETCO2 in the first place. Remember, your carbon dioxide, Vikram is asking if probe is not available. Then I don't think you are in a good hospital setting. If probe is ETCO2 probe is not available, then it's better I suggest to quit that hospital and join a good hospital. Because ETCO2 probe is something uh, mandatory one. Uh, really. So if you don't have that probe, then there is no point in uh, doing a CPR itself according to me. Okay. Uh, then uh, you check for, uh, why you check for CO2? Because CO2 is a very, very important marker of metabolism going on in the body. So whenever there is a cardiac arrest, in a cardiac arrest, there will be no circulation. If there is no circulation, there is no metabolism. 
going on no metabolism going on so because the heart is not beating there is no metabolism that is achieved so what you are trying to do in cpr is temporarily you are suspending this cardiac arrest scenario and you are trying to achieve some circulation some circulation and you are trying to achieve some metabolism in the body some metabolism in the body so i mean that some circulation that is achieved and some that some metabolism that is achieved should be at least of some decent value so that is why we uh, set a criteria of at least 10 mm of mercury uh, etco2 is minimal mandatory normal etco2 is yes uh, not 30 to 45 so remember there is something called paco2 that's called a p arterial co2 that is uh, the range of 35 to 45 mm of mercury and you have a etco2 etco2 is always less than the paco2 by approximately like uh, 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury it will always be less than the pacu so i don't believe in the fact that it will be 30 to 45 uh, it usually must be in the range of around 28 to 36 or 38 so that's what i believe it it will never reach the normal pacu to value so normal pacu to 35 to 45 and etcu is always reduce i mean uh, uh, below pacu to by at least 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury in the normal patient but we are talking about an rs patient an rs patient by just uh, doing a cpr you cannot achieve the you know like uh, circulation as that of a no it's not 5 to 12 mm of mercury uh, 5 to 12 mm of mercury lesser than the pacu2 value so pacu2 is 30 to 4, 35 to 45 means uh, etcu2 will be somewhere around that 28 to 38 so that's how it will be okay so what i was telling is uh, yeah etcu2 similarly you cannot achieve a normal etcu2 during a cpr because uh, you are you cannot mimic a heart heart is you know, like something a natural organ and you cannot achieve the normal circulation at all so which means if you cannot achieve a normal circulation you will not be able to reach a uh, normal metabolism which means you cannot reach a normal etcu2 as well so what is the amount of uh, circulation that you can achieve by doing a good quality cpr just 20 percentage just 20 percentage is the efficiency of the cpr a good cpr in fact only 20 percentage is what you are going to achieve what to do in a psychiatric patient uh, behave like faint i don't i can't understand psychiatry i mean i think you are asking about malingering or uh, you are asking about some uh, patient who is not actually having a cardiac arrest but behaving like a cardiac arrest obviously you will have a pulse then why you want to do a cpr in the first place it will be uh, addressed like other cause of collapse only okay so yeah 20 percent of cardiac output that's what i mean so i mean that is that is the much you can achieve by a lot of uh, studies it's been clear that uh, even in a very good quality cpr you can achieve only 20% of the cardiac output that will be the efficiency of your cpr nothing more than that so to achieve that itself you need a good quality cpr anyways we have talked about shock and energy is there any role for drugs in cpr so we have done a shockable and non shockable rhythm is there any role for drugs in cpr answer is yes or answer is no is there any role for drugs in cpr yes of course yes gurpit singh rathore the first answer is atropine and that's absolutely wrong we don't give atropine any clear so drugs in cpr so drugs in cpr uh, i can split as whether uh, it's a shockable rhythm or a non shockable rhythm shockable rhythm and a non shockable rhythm so what are the drugs we can see first drug is uh, adrenaline one of the very very important drugs as far as cpr is concerned adrenaline shockable rhythm yes non shockable rhythm yes but the evidence is more towards non shockable rhythm evidence is actually a little bit more towards a non shockable rhythm compared to that of a shockable rhythm and uh, it's uh, very imperative to know the dose of adrenaline so what is the dose of adrenaline you will give that's uh, really really important obviously uh, during cpr you are going to use iv adrenaline and you have to always dilute it and the dilution you are going to use is 1 is to 10000 and 1 mg of adrenaline diluted to 1 is to 10000 and you will be giving iv so this is the usual dose of uh, adrenaline as far as cpr is concerned and uh, whether you can repeat or not answer is yes again yes you can repeat adrenaline you can repeat every 3 to 5 minutes every 3 to 5 minutes you can repeat adrenaline so this is very very important 
which means what I tell my residents is the fact like each CPR cycle will last for two minutes. Each CPR cycle will last for two minutes. So you can actually give adrenaline every alternative CPR. So first CPR you give adrenaline, second you don't give and third cycle you give again. So every alternate cycle you can give adrenaline. So that's how I teach my residents. So what if it's available as 1 is to 1000? So that's why I'm telling you, dilute it to... So remember this 1 milligram of adrenaline uh, means it's 1 is to 1000 only because 1 gram is 1000 milligram, right? So all, obviously it's available in 1 is to 1000 only. So you have to dilute it 10 ml and you have to inject it. So that's how you have to give adrenaline. So that's the guideline says because uh, directly giving adrenaline in a undiluted form, IV, might result in serious vasoconstriction in the local area especially in the peripheral circuit and uh, you might not be able to see the pulse and uh, second thing you might not be uh, able to achieve good peripheral circulation and even the limbs might go for gangrene in worst case scenario so it's better to avoid this direct full dose IV adrenaline straight away even if you do intraosseous route is the same dose yes same dose there is no difference even intraosseous route is the same dose but in adults we generally don't give an intraosseous route only for children, sometimes you can uh, give in the tibia, which is the interosseous, best interosseous route. But apart from that, in adults, uh, we don't give any interosseous route. I mean, in general, really. Remember, and one more thing uh, is the fact that uh, intracardiac adrenaline is completely removed from the guidelines. So, in 2000, the, the last intracardiac uh, guidelines was mentioned in 2005. After that, there was no mention about this intracardiac adrenaline at all. And it's been very clear that there is no purpose or no extra benefit that you're going to get because of intracardiac adrenaline. And apart from that, you're going to injure a lot of vessels. You're going to damage the myocardium, which can raise the troponins. And you can confuse with the MI. It itself can cause a serious MI. You can damage a coronary vessel. So it's not a good thing to do that. So don't give an intracardiac adrenaline. So what is the reason why you give adrenaline? Can anyone tell why you want to give adrenaline in case of a cardiac arrest? What is the role of adrenaline in a cardiac arrest? SA node activity to increase cardiac output and also for BP to stimulate the heart by beta 1. All these answers are wrong. So we don't give adrenaline to stimulate the heart. That's an old school thought. It's been very clear we give adrenaline only to increase the coronary perfusion. So adrenaline will definitely increase the coronary perfusion. So to increase the coronary perfusion, we give adrenaline. So we don't give to increase the BP. We don't give to restart the heart. We don't give to stimulate the heart. We don't give to stimulate the SA node. The role of adrenaline is to maintain the coronary perfusion. So that is the reason we do that. So anyways, that is the role of adrenaline. And uh, at the same time, atropin, no, absolutely no role for atropin. Absolutely no role. And uh, it was removed in the 2005 guidelines itself. Last mentioned in 2005 and from the 2010, we don't have any atropin in the guideline. So there is no role for atropin. So if they ask you what is the alternative to adrenaline, in 2010, this was the last mention, in 2010 guideline vasopressin, was considered as an alternative to adrenaline but uh, later on they found out uh, during 2011 and 12 there are multiple studies which came up which told vasopressin is equal in efficacy to adrenaline epinephrine and uh, to maintain universality in 2015 guideline they removed the vasopressin as well so which means there is only epinephrine right now from 2015 guidelines onwards there is no vasopressin per se clear so this is the uh, role of adrenaline. Is there any role for antiarrhythmics? Yes, you can give amiodarone. Our alternative for amiodarone is going to be lignocaine. Lignocaine can be considered as an alternative. Amiodarone can be considered in shockable rhythm and lignocaine also can be considered in shockable rhythm but none of this should be considered in non-shockable rhythms because in non-shockable rhythms and they are not going to have any role at all. So what is the dose of amiodarone? What's going to be the dose of amiodarone? Dose, remember you can give two doses basically uh, as far as amiodarone is concerned. So you will give 300 milligram. That is the bolus dose. That is the first dose that you generally give. You can repeat the dose. Just one more dose you can give, 150 milligram. That's the second dose. 
and there is only two doses that's all nothing else after that uh, you need not give only two doses uh, you, you can give for amitro nothing more clear so lignocaine yes you can give two doses similarly lignocaine uh, initial dose must be 1 to 1.5 mg per kg but remember the standard dose is 100 mg this is what you will prefer usually like when you go to the field settings you will understand the standard dose is 1 to 1.5 mg but standard is 100 mg that's all this is a usual lignocaine vial that is available and the second dose this is the first dose and the second dose you can give is somewhere around 0.5 to 0.75 mg per kg that is half dose and the standard is 50 mg that's what we give second dose lignocaine in adult patients we give 150 followed by that so two two doses you can give maximum two doses that is nothing more than that and when you are going to give these drugs if i ask adrenaline if i ask the question when you will give adrenaline in a cpr in a during a cpr cycle it has to be given after the second shock after the second shock you have to give adrenaline in case of a shockable rhythm suppose if it's a non shockable rhythm non shockable rhythm you will be giving immediately as soon as possible you will be giving immediately without wasting any time so is there any sense in this so like why uh, you have to give uh, uh, immediately in case of a non shockable rhythm and you have to give uh, uh, you know like uh, after second shock in case of a shockable rhythm yes there are a considerable amount of sense in that because what i told you is the fact that uh, when you see a shockable rhythm the next step is to shock the patient the next step is to shock the patient uh intra tracheal route superior i don't think so because in 2015 guidelines they have clearly mentioned only iv route or io route intra tracheal route uh, has been removed from the guideline in 2015 and they clearly mentioned there is no uh, benefit that is proved with intra tracheal route compared to that of the intravenous or the intraosseous route so right now we have only iv and io route intraosseous so i mean let, let me come back to that so what is the idea of giving uh, amitron i mean adrenaline after the second shock remember you know it's a shockable rhythm and uh, if you see a vt or a vf obviously the next step is shock and not giving adrenaline so that is why uh, first next step is shock so you might ask me sir it's a shockable rhythm so immediately after the first shock i can give um, adrenaline or amiodarone right so why i cannot give adrenaline after the first shock because there is iv line that's the idea so there is no iv line here so after the first shock you will be busy in inserting an iv line iv cannula because the patient is not having an iv cannula suppose assume a patient is in the road and he has been brought and the aed comes and you see the shockable rhythm and you have immediately shocked it and after the shock where is the iv line so that's what you will be doing after the first shock you will be actually inserting an iv line so that is the reason why after the second shock you are going to give adrenaline after the third shock you can give amiodarone or lignocaine so which means when you are going to give amiodarone or lignocaine so if they ask you when when you are going to give amiodarone or lignocaine answer is after third shock after third shock right obviously in a non shockable rhythm there is no role of amiodarone or lignocaine so but anyways in a non shockable rhythm it's immediately because uh, in a non shockable rhythm there is no shock so as soon as possible immediately once the iv line is achieved you can start with adrenaline here. no problem adrenaline yes sir but there is no role for amiodarone or lignocaine in this setting so because it's a non shockable rhythm as i already told you you cannot uh, give amiodarone or lignocaine fine so what are what are the things about advanced airway remember advanced airway as i told you it includes it should be either laryngeal mask airway or a endotracheal tube any suprachoroidal airway is fine but in general in the current era we prefer an lma so we have a lot of new types of lma in, in my hospital we prefer lma supreme or uh, igel devices that's what we prefer in our hospital for uh, the sake of using an lma but most of the times we go for the endotracheal intubation if there is an expert available so if there is no expert uh, who's who doesn't know to intubate if there is a resident there who's a little bit anxious about intubation then uh, i mean we su I suggest them to do a laryngeal mask airway i mean we use the latest devices like lma supreme and igel which is really good actually and uh, most of them have a good uh, you know like first pass success rate and uh, that's why we prefer those devices anyways 
fine. ETT is what is preferred whenever there is an expert available in your setting. Anyways, and the position of the ET tube should be confirmed by waveform capnography. Somebody asked in the beginning that uh, what is the role of waveform capnography. Immediately whenever you give an advanced airway, you have to do a waveform capnography. And please do understand, whenever there is a uh, waveform capnography, you have to, uh, you know, whenever there is an advanced airway that is available, you have to uh, give the CPR uh, with the prescribed chest compression and the rescue breath. That is chest compression should be 100 to 120 and the rescue breath should be exactly 10 per minute and nothing more than that. Suppose if you are not having an advanced airway, then in those setting you can follow the traditional chest compression to rescue breath ratio that is 30 is to 2. So in that setting you can uh, do 30 is to 2 but if you have an advanced airway in place, it's always important that you maintain uh, that uh, chest compression rate of 100 to 120 and rescue breath of not more than 10 per minute, which is uh, clearly important. But for confirmation, fiber optic bronchoscopy, I think uh, you are grossly mistaking Niharika. I think, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not telling it's your fault because you are not uh, practiced in the field settings, I guess. So that is the reason why you are using these words like uh, fiber optic uh, bronchoscopy. Remember the fact that fiber optic bronchoscopy is never useful in a CPR. You know, like uh, that is fiber optic bronchoscopy can be fiber optic bronchoscopy can be preferred in the setting of a difficult intubation, the setting of a typical difficult intubation. But we never use a fiber optic bronchoscopy in a CPR, so we don't do that. You can do a video laryngoscope, that's fine. So that and all is fine. To you enhance your uh, fast speed but uh, you're not going to uh, use a fiber optic bronchoscope suppose if you feel and uh, intubation will hamper CPR Asish has told actually that's correct and uh, if you ask me intubation versus chest compressions what you have to choose is the fact that you always choose chest compression ahead of intubation suppose if you think that uh, intubation is uh, going to delay your chest compressions or intubation is going to grossly uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, stop your chest compressions for a longer period of time, then I'll always go for chest compressions rather than intubation because, I mean, uninterrupted chest compressions is the key. So you should never interrupt chest compressions at any cost. Remember, for confirming the position, for confirming the position, ETCO2 is the gold standard, nothing else. You cannot confirm the position. ETCO2 is always the gold standard. Even chest X-ray is not the gold standard. Chest X-ray after ETCO2 confirmation, post ETCO2 confirmation, you can take a chest x-ray to confirm the position. Clear? Uh, like exact correct position of the endotracheal tube, whether it's in the carina properly or it has gone into the right bronchus. For that, you can do a chest x-ray, but for confirming whether the tube is in the trachea or the esophagus, ETCO2 is the gold standard. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Confirmation of tube best is fiber optic bronchus so given an answer. I mean, to be honest, I don't know where it is given really in Niharika, but uh, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know, but maybe some textbook, some line might have told, but I'm talking about practicality. So you can't uh, really use a fiber optic bronchoscope for confirming the position. Maybe QBank, yes, that's right. Like, I understand it must be a question and there must be some textbook line which uh, somebody must have mistaken it grossly. And that is the reason, but I don't think uh, there is any point in using a fiber optic bronchoscopy for the sake of confirming the position of the endotracheal tube. Anyways, fine. So nobody uses that fiber optic bronchoscope to confirm the position. In the absence of advanced airway means 30 is to 2 means there may be interest. No, no. 30 is to 2 means 30 compressions is to 2 breaths, which means doing, during the compression itself, you are going to do chest breaths. It's not like, I mean, my God, you are actually try thinking that I will give 30 compressions and followed by 2 breaths and then 30 compressions followed by 2 breaths. No. During the 30 compressions, when somebody is giving the CPR itself, they are going to give the breaths at the same time. There is absolutely no interruption. So don't worry about that. I think you have mistaken the fact that you will give 30 compressions first, then you will give 2 breaths, then again 30 compressions, then you will give 2 breaths. No, no, not like that. Don't do that. So it's not, uh, I mean, there is some uh, thing you have mistaken it already. Okay. Now, what will be the outcome of the CPR? So now you have tried so much for the patient. Yes, you have tried so much for the patient. 
so there is something called an outcome what are the outcome what, what are the outcomes of the cpr outcomes of the cpr can be uh, two either the it means failed cpr which means uh, the patient uh, code blue has failed and uh, he has declared dead that's what we call it as a failed cpr yeah i'll come back to that so it's a nice question to ask vikram is asking how long to do a cpr i'll come back to that i'll come back to that it's a failed cpr or it could be a rosc that is a return of spontaneous circulation so which means that's a success this is a successful cpr so that's a return of spontaneous circulation so how long you should take before you uh, tell it as a failed cpr remember there is no guideline which tells that no guideline which can tell how long you have to continue cpr there has been evidences where cpr has been continued for one and a half to two hours still they have resuscitated the patient uh, successfully yeah these devices are actually quite good we have one in our hospital this automated cpr devices where the chest compressions is done automatically by the devices itself that is done because uh, to avoid the manual fatigue so we have one devices in our hospital like uh, what uh, it really is is like it helps you in ma i mean the machine itself will start compressing the chest when you uh, i mean fix it properly and it will give it a correct rate advantage and it doesn't have a fatigue that's one more advantage and uh, you can avoid injury to the chest as well because sometimes over enthusiastic cpr can broke break the ribs and it can damage uh, your lungs and cause pneumothorax and a lot of problems are there so all these things can be a, to a great extent avoided with this automated devices but anyways whether these automated devices are good in comparison with the manual cpr or not is uh, completely different so that is not yet known properly but the current guidelines tell that there is no benefit in terms of survival whether you use an automated device versus a manual compression but whenever you are doing a manual compression it is imperative to actually rotate the personnel every 2 minutes because it's been proved that every 2 minutes you have to rotate because they get fatigue and the efficiency of cpr will get either low or it might get too much high because of the frustration uh, that because they are getting fatigued and uh, they show it as you know like they try to give uh, more cpr in that uh, setting so yes in that setting this automated devices are very useful but if you correctly rotate the personnel every 2 minutes and uh, every cycle you change the personnel then it might not be a, a problem the ideal position on the chest to apply compression definitely not on the left side of the chest it's in the mediastinum uh, like uh, maybe above the zygoid sternum so that is the right position for giving a cpr so in the midline just maybe slightly to the left of the midline but uh, not on the left side of the chest so that is the right position anyways so there is no i mean uh, i'll come back to this there is no guideline that can tell where the cpr how long to continue with the cpr so in that setting uh, minimum duration of cpr should be 20 minutes or 10 cycles that's minimum requirement before uh, declaring it as a failed cpr so that's what the guideline tell that's a minimum requirement but ethically speaking no guideline can tell the maximum uh, duration so if you are willing to do even for 3 hours of cpr nobody is going to stop you so no guideline can tell you you can stop after 30 minutes or you can stop after 40 minutes but uh, minimum requirement is 20 minutes or 10 cycles of cpr is mandatory before declaring it as a failed cpr so when you tell it as a i mean when i mean after 20 i mean 20 minutes of cpr uh, how can you decide that the patient is uh, uh going to have a failed cpr or not again your idea is going to come from n-tidal carbon dioxide your etcvo2 if it is persistently less than 10 mm of mercury even after 20 minutes of your cpr even after 10 cycles of your cpr is over still your etcvo2 is 10 mm per minute it is likely to be a failed cpr likely likely i'm not telling definitely but likely to be a failed cpr clear so uh, that is the criteria to tell probably the cpr might fail but still uh, you know like uh, there is there is no limit to tell how long you have to continue with the cpr and when to stop the cpr so minimum is 20 cycles i mean 20 minutes 10 cycles and if after those still if it is over less than 10 you can probably think that the patient might not survive and you can probably start withdrawing the cpr but anyways that's your wish how long to continue so return of spontaneous circulation so whenever the patient is going for rosc what is the gold standard for it what is the gold standard for rosc anyone 
anyone can tell what is the gold standard for uh, ROSC? What is the gold standard? Yes, ETCO2 once again. So ETCO2 is a gold standard for return of spontaneous circulation. So let me draw the ETCO2 curve. So this is going to be a normal ETCO2 curve. To be honest, this is how it looks like. Normal ETCO2 curve. Whenever there is a flat line, probably you think about a cardiac arrest, even though there is uh, many causes for that. So it could be a cardiac arrest. But even though many causes are there, for example, you have to remember about the dopes, uh, that's called, uh, I mean, all these causes are causes of uh, flat ETCO2, disconnection, obstruction, pneumothorax and patient related factors like pulmonary embolism, flash pulmonary edema, equipment failure and stacked breath. Stacked breath means uh, that's completely ventilator based uh, thing, that's a completely ventilator based thing, that is what we refer to as stacked breaths or otherwise referred to as an auto peep. So that's why, disconnection, obstruction. Uh, patient related factors. Patient related factors means it could be pneumothorax, it could be a pulmonary embolism, it could be many things. Patient related factors and uh, equipment failure and stacked breath. So, this dope. So, anything could cause a flat ETCO2 along with cardiac arrest. Uh, all these things can cause a flat ETCO2 line. So, whenever there is a flat ETCO2 line and you know it's a cardiac arrest, in this setting, you are seeing some waveform like this. So, whenever you see these kind of waveforms, it means some good souls like you is giving a CPR. That's what it means. As I already told you, the height of the ETCO2 curve should be at least more than 10 millimeters of mercury. And this is what is going to tell a good CPR quality. Good CPR quality. But please do understand the fact that uh, if it is less than 10 millimeters of mercury, even after 10 cycles of CPR, then it's probably going to tell you a poor prognosis. So then, after this kind of series of lines, you suddenly see a big lines coming like this. You suddenly see some big lines coming like this. So this is what is going to indicate a return of spontaneous circulation, which means sudden rise in the ETCO2 curve from the previous value. So this is going to tell the patient has achieved return of spontaneous circulation. This can be further confirmed by pulse, by origination of blood pressure without any support, and uh, probably uh, by uh, seeing your intraarterial waveform, spontaneous intraarterial waveforms, these things can tell you that the patient might probably having uh, return of spontaneous circulation. So this is what you have to consider. So whenever you think about uh, CPR, and apart from that, uh, you have to evaluate for some reversible causes. So what do you mean by reversible causes? What do you mean by reversible causes? ACCHA guidelines tell there are 5 H and 5 T's which always has to be thought of and always has to be addressed. What are the 5 H? The first H is hypovolemia which you can correct easily by giving IV fluids. Second H is hypoxia uh, which again you can cover it by giving endotracheal intubation and giving a good uh, oxygen. And uh, third is hydrogen ions or I can write H plus ions, which means acidosis, that's what I mean. You can correct it very easily by getting soda bicarbonate. And the hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, once again you can correct it by giving a just a dextrose. And you have a hypo and hyperkalemia, hypo and hyperkalemia, which again you can correct it easily by uh, certain measures. And the 5 T's include tension pneumothorax, it's a, one of the top causes for reversible because in tension pneumothorax you have to just insert a whiteboard needle in the uh, either probably in the right second intercostal space or in the right I mean I mean the either way and whenever there is wherever there is a pneumothorax in that side you are going to insert a whiteboard needle like uh, 16 G or 14 G needle either in the second intercostal space in the mid clavicular line or in the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line so you can prefer any site so tension pneumothorax rapidly relievable condition and you can have a tamponade cardiac tamponade Again, you can treat this rapidly by just removing the fluid under the echo guidance. And you have a lot of toxins which you can treat easily, like for example, TCA poisoning, uh, tricyclic uh, acid anti, I mean, uh, this, uh, what is that? 
TCA antidepressants are there, no? like amitriptyline. So they, those can be actually treated very easily because they tend to cause ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular arrhythmias related to TCAs can be easily treated with soda bicarbonate infusions. That's the antidote for that. You can uh, do and uh, thrombosis of coronaries where you can do take for PCA immediately and uh, thrombosis of pulmonary veins, pulmonary vessels where again you can do thrombolysis, coronary or pulmonary. Pulmonary thrombus. These are the five T's and five P's, uh, which are uh, likely to be highly reversible. Which you can reverse it very fast. Always look for reversible causes, as far as CPR is concerned. Clear? You look for the reversible causes. Okay. Now, what are the predict? I mean, uh, you have done an ROSC. You have uh, done a return of spontaneous circulation. The patient has achieved a circulatory status, but what about the neurological status? Whether uh, the patient will be brain dead or whether the patient will be having some uh, residual defect or patient will be in uh, complete coma for the rest of their life, whether is it uh, possible to predict them or not? So that's the question. So how will you predict them? Is it possible to predict them? So actually, yes, you can predict ROSC, predict the neurological outcome because this is a very important area. So what are the predictors of neurological outcome? after return of spontaneous circulation, predictors of neurological outcome. And uh, with a pinch of salt, I need to tell that this uh, predictors, whatever I'm going to tell, should be assessed only after 72 hours. Only after 72 hours of uh, ROSC, you should not assess within 72 hours because within 72 hours, it is a uh, little bit difficult to assess all this, uh, you know, like uh, predictors, outcomes based on this predictors. And very importantly, one of the post ROC care is there. There is an entity called post ROC care. That's a separate guideline. Post ROC care. So much is there under this post ROC care section. But uh, if you ask me, what are the components that will come under post ROC care? Right from the ventilator settings to your uh, blood pressure to your inotropes. For all these things, we have good guidelines. Post ROC care. But that will not be your exam question. But what is one important thing that you have to follow during the post ROC period that is routinely followed by many of the tertiary care hospitals is the therapeutic hypothermia. That's really important. Therapeutic hypothermia. I mean, uh, anomic analysis, I'll try to do that, but I don't think there is a time. Otherwise, you'll miss out on important things. So therapeutic hypothermia, which is uh, really, really important. So this is something associated with the excellent prognosis, excellent outcome as far as post ROC patients are concerned. Therapeutic hypothermia is uh, a method where you are going to uh, reduce the body temperature by and maintain it around somewhere around 33 to 36 degrees Celsius. You will be maintaining around 33 to 36 degrees Celsius. I mean normal body temperature is around 38 degrees Celsius but you slightly reduce it and keep it maintained it around 33 to 36 degree Celsius and uh, I mean it, it can be easily achieved by infusing cold desalines and uh, we'll use I mean in our hospital I'll tell how we do that we uh, infuse cold desalines continuously and uh, we actually see the tympanic membrane temperature so we have a tympanic membrane probe continuously measuring the temperature as well and uh, we infuse cold desalines and maintain the temperature in that rate so that associated with an excellent outcome absolutely very good outcome and one of the best areas where you can give therapeutic hypothermia is uh, post ROC care. Uh, what is the base of giving therapeutic hypothermia? Remember, they reduce the cerebral metabolic rate because uh, temperature when you increase it increases the metabolic rate by reducing the cerebral metabolic demands and uh, cerebral oxygen demands and reducing the cerebral metabolic rate. You can uh, basically help in uh, improving the brain outcomes, especially the neurological outcomes. And many trials have proven that uh, it's really good. So. No, not only for shockable rhythm patients, for any ROC patients, post ROC patients, you can use therapeutic hypothermia. It's not only for uh, shockable rhythm. For any post ROC patients, you can try here. Yeah? It's for improving the brain outcome. It's not for, uh, you know, like whether shockable or not shockable. It is for improving the brain outcome after a return of spontaneous circulation. So what are the predictors? We didn't uh, study about this predictor. So predictors of uh, neurological outcome after 72 hours. I mean, you, you have to assess all this only after 72 hours. So what are the things you're going to see? Clinical predictors are there. Clinically, you can uh, see the motor response. 
there's no motor response it indicate a poor prognosis then you can see a corneal reflex and conjunctival reflex but corneal reflex is what is more important so you can see a corneal reflex and conjunctival reflex but corneal reflex is what is going to be the most important so one of the important predictors only we fit patients at therapeutic option you can actually do uh, in asystole patients also suppose if they are going for a uh, post rvc then you have uh, this pupillary reflex which you can assess clinically pupillary reflex apart from that you have uh, myoclonus persistent myoclonus myoclonus are uh, jerky movements of the limbs and remember myoclonus is always a sign of brain injury persistent myoclonus even after 72 hours how intubation can be done without interruption of chest compression actually it cannot be done vikram uh but we have to do as soon as possible that is why if you think that the interruptions are going to be more than 15 to 20 seconds then it's better to avoid intubation in that setting or you can prefer probably a laryngeal mask airway suppose uh, if you think the intubation can be done within 10 to 20 seconds for that matters then it's okay to interrupt the cpr because in that setting you can give a little bit preference to the airway for that matters but anyways so the first cpr compression first cpr uh, for 2 minutes first 2 to 3 cycles should always be on so if you are very clear and the best person is very experienced in intubating then you can okay fine 10 to 20 seconds of interruption is fine not a problem but the first cycle of cpr should be given that should not be uh, bypassed because of the intubation so every whatever if even if you are trying to intubate do it after the first cycle anyways myoclonus these are the clinical predictors but there are some eeg predictors also eeg again presence of myoclonic seizures or status myoclonicus even after 72 i mean especially after 48 hours is going to tell you a very very poor prognosis and there is something called a burst suppression pattern assessed with a very very poor prognosis and here something called n20 ssep that's called somatosensory evoked potential if it is bilaterally absent and this is the best predictor so far till now this is the best predictor it has 100% specificity to call them as dead and this indicates a dead patient actually which means only circulation is going on technically they are not dead but practically speaking they are dead so 100% specificity to declare them dead uh, definitely that's the only thing among all the criteria which i'm going to tell end to end by end to tsscp if it's bilaterally absent that's the only thing that has 100% sensitivity to tell patient as surely dead but sensitivity is very less only like uh, maybe 10 to 15 percentage but specificity is very good 100% surely you can tell the patient is dead and uh, you have some uh, serum markers also there are two markers which we use commonly that is neuron specific inhalation in s100 if they are grossly elevated then again uh, nse levels typically speaking in our hospital we do nse we don't use s100 nse levels of more than 34 generally tells you a poor prognosis but still uh, you can use any of these markers either a neuron specific inhalation or a s100 or you can use imaging techniques also imaging techniques you can do ct or you can do an mri as well ct you will be i mean ct and mri what you are trying to uh, predict is the gray white differentiation so depending on the hounds will units but in our hospital we use ct than an mri in ct uh, you will be seeing that gray white differentiation depending on the hounds will units suppose if there is no gray white differentiation and uh, all looks almost the same so then you might probably think about a very poor prognosis and neurological outcome and uh, probably in an mri you can think about seeing diffusion so if there is uh, restricted diffusion globally then in that setting also you can tell probably it's a very poor prognosis but please understand that uh, many of these markers are specific only if you do after 72 hours if you do within 72 hours uh, it's actually fairly not uh, very good to do uh last eeg print that is n20 somatosensory evoked potential that's called n20 ssep that's if it's bilaterally absent that is the best predictor of whether the patient has i mean is practically dead or not so it's a brain dead patient that's all not brain dead to be honest that should not be called as a brain dead but practically speaking it's like a dead patient only 100% specificity for a bad neurological outcome and the patient will not come out of uh or i mean that uh, neurological coma so more than 72 hours is what you have to do and make sure that the patient is not in therapeutic hypothermia make sure that the patient is not in therapeutic hypothermia especially when you are using clinical predictors whenever you are using clinical predictors make sure the patient is not in 
therapeutic hypothermia because when the patient is in hypothermia low body temperature itself can uh, break this responses so carnal reflex may not be there pupillary reflex may not be there that is just because of the hypothermia itself so you cannot uh, predict the clinical predictors if the patient is in hypothermia so make sure the patient is not in hypothermia and you do all this testing after 72 hours so these are uh, the predictors of a poor neurological outcome clear i think uh, we have discussed in detail about uh, the class today i think uh, this session should have been useful to you i think we'll sign it off with this thank you very much and good night and uh, have a good time